to shout OA at the count of three. And I want people to kind of just like get it, like, I, because this talk cannot happen if people will be half asleep. So at the count of three, we're all going to say OA. Okay? Three, sorry. <laughs> See, I was checking out the interview words. All you were One, two, three. A little louder. This is too weak. Come on, there are like, what, 50 people in the room right now? The more we have we have a stronger voice than this, right? Oh, so, <laughs> See, you're not being designing as we go along. Okay, so one, two, three. Awesome. So I'm going to talk about another topic that you might have heard a lot over the last two days, but I'm going to try to bring a twist in it and hopefully keep you engaged. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is a little different to design, but it applies to design because everything I'm going to talk about now is something I learned as a designer. I'm going to talk about how you can be more empathetic towards your team members and build, build, build a culture that's more well-rounded by bringing this UX principles to uh, your team. So. So let me start by kind of explaining a little bit what I mean by UX and empathy. So for me, UX and empathy are very interlinked. They're like, you know, the same, uh, two sides of the same coin. You cannot do good UX without being empathetic. And empathy just in itself without translating into an action is just a feeling that you probably have walking around the city without any action. So, but what is also for me very synergic about UX and empathy is the vulnerability that comes with it. When you're being empathetic, you are kind of showing a side of yourself and letting people kind of see that and being emotional and vulnerable about it. The same is true about design or UX because when you're talking about UX, you are kind of letting your design go out in the wild and hoping that people will not trash it. So it's, there's a vulnerability that's associated with it and, and that's what I'm going to talk about. So I'm going to use these terms very interchangeably throughout the presentation. So in this presentation, in this context, they mean one and the same for me. So, so let's start by, this is the dictionary definition of what empathy means. It's, it's the ability of being able to walk in someone's shoes, right? Uh, it's, well, there are different kind of empathies. This is what cognitive empathy means. Uh, for me, empathy is a very humanistic trait. Right? It's something that we humans are blessed with. And it, it should go beyond how we care about a user. It should also go into how we develop processes and build teams. And that's kind of what I'm going to talk about. And this quote by uh, Whitney Hess, who's an executive coach and uh, a designer, kind of sums what I'm going to talk about. Because if you design the product without really designing the team, it's for nothing. You can't sustain a rock star product without designing for the culture and the team. So next, I'm going to pick four UX principles that I'm sure all of you will be familiar with. And I'm going to tie it to the story that happened with me very early on in my career. And and I'm going to just say how I use those principles to kind of navigate my way through that. So UX is a conversation, and I think building culture is the same thing. As UX people, we're always striking a dialogue with the users. We're trying to understand what their goals are, what do they want to do, and then like fulfill those goals with their designs. Building culture is very similar. So let me tell you a story, and then we'll get into the principles about it. So after my master's, I, I did my first job. It was awesome. My post manager was a gym of a person. She was what I call my human shield. She was the person who would watch for me in all the meetings. Like, first few weeks were crazy for me. I was presenting to VP and all, and I was shit scared. It was like my first job, right? So, but she was always, she always had my bad back. Eight months in, long story short, she left to pursue another career. And I got another manager. And because that was my first experience with a manager, I expected the same things. Well, oddly enough, it was not the same. This guy had a little empathy towards me, or that, at least that's what I thought initially, and things got sour really quickly. Every meeting we would be in, I would feel, I would leave feeling inadequate. It's a feeling we all must have had at some point when we feel like what we're doing is not making a difference, or we're not able to get to the problem, like what is wrong, why is this person not liking me? So I was convinced either he thought I was really incompetent, or he hated me. And both of the scenarios seemed really odd to me because I was like, hey, I was doing fine like a couple of months back and I don't know what changed, right? So it got really bad where I was on the verge of quitting. Like, I was like, I don't know, I can't deal with this. There's too much negativity, my productivity went down. I was just like, getting to work was stressful. I talked to this person on my team who I considered a mentor 
And I told her my side of the story. I was like, hey, this is what's happening. I feel shitty about it. I don't know how to, how to go beyond it. And she said something very, very simple, but something I hadn't done. She was like, have you told him how you feel about it? I was like, isn't that obvious? Like, doesn't he realize that he's hurting me? Like, that's how we expect, right? Like, we want people to understand what we're feeling without having to talk about it, because talking about it is a little hard, and it kind of also makes things more concrete. So I mulled over it for a day, and I realized, well, I've actually never actually told him that, hey, I'm, I'm not happy with how things are going. I would just expect him to figure it out. So that's what I started off with. This one principle that we all have kind of like, you know, this one thing that's taught to us, understand the problem. What is the problem? Is my view of the problem his view of the problem? Does he think even there is a problem? Maybe he is not even realizing there is a problem, right? So in that case, I started with like, I need to figure out what the problem is. And I didn't really have anything to lose. I was, and he was ready to quit. So I was like, okay, I'm going to try to find the problem. So what understanding the problem, and we all know that, helps us do is sometimes we actually find that the problem we thought initially is not the right problem we're chasing. If there's probably more problems, that's not the right angle. And, and that's what I started doing. I tried trying to understand more of his motivations. And what I did next, which is the hardest thing of all, is ask for help. I, I took him out for a coffee, and I was like, hey, so this is happening. And we do be, I'm feeling bad about things, and you know, can you help me? That's the hardest thing because it does two things. One, it formalizes the thing that there is a problem. You're accepting that there is a problem, and you're basically not pushing it under the rug. If the problem is really bad, people usually leave. If it's too less, people bear with it, thinking this is the way things are supposed to be. The second thing that does when you ask for help is you're basically saying, I'm not able to do it on my own. I need someone's help. And that's culturally, in a lot of companies, it's something that's not promoted because asking for help means you're saying you're weak, you're not competent enough to do it on your own. But I actually look at it very differently, and this is something that was taught to us in grad school in a conflict management course, because when you ask for help, you're basically putting down the person in the driver's seat. You're asking the person, hey, this is what I'm feeling, can you help me do that? And the person is more likely to help you rather than admit they were wrong. Or when you point a finger, you're just like, you get into this argument and that's about it. It doesn't go anywhere. So this is one strategy I've, I've learned at grad school as a designer, and I've like, practiced it throughout. When you are having an issue, ask for help. You're not going to get any brownie points, any bonuses for figuring it out on your own. But when you have help, you have, one, you make get to understand the understanding that there's a problem, and second, you have somebody to work with. Like we all designers, nobody wants to work in silence. So why do it when we're dealing with people? So next what I did was, next what happened once I communicated this with my manager is, is something very interesting. He, he realized he was dealing with somebody he didn't understand. And that whole principle that the user is not me. He was dealing with me thinking I was him or somebody like him or somebody that he had dealt with in the past and he was not paying attention to my needs and what I needed. So his problem was he had not managed many teams and most of the people he had worked with were his peers. So this guy who's 45 is except, 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 sorry, expecting, <laughs> expecting a 24-year-old to kind of you know, work with him on that. And that's where I was like, oh, I, I need mentorship. I need kind of, you know, when I'm doing something wrong, I want to know that I'm doing something right or wrong. I need feedback. I need mentoring. I just don't want you to tell me, hey, this is not good. We'll figure it out because I need that guidance. And for him also, it was a huge learning thing. I, he sent me a note one saying, my girlfriend is going to really thank you because you're kind of making me a little bit more human. Right? So I think it's, it's very necessary to have those conversations because sometimes the other person doesn't realize your point of view. You don't uh, realize their point of view. And there's empathy that's needed at both ends, whether you're a manager or somebody under somebody. And, and then that's when you realize that this person is not really evil. He doesn't wake up thinking, hey, I'm going to wake up this morning and I'm going to make life hell for this person. Right? I don't think anybody is that evil in this room or outside of it. But when you look at somebody else's point of view, you realize, OK, they're just reacting based on the information they have. And that's about it. So when you open the conversation, when you ask for help, you realize all of these things. So OK, so we had established there was a problem. And he had realized he was dealing with somebody he didn't understand. So the next step was communicating what went wrong. 
By doing that, oh, sorry, that's this guy. So, by doing that, this is the principle that's still the most. Clarity above all. So, when we look at this image, what, what is it that stands out? Home Please don't say pizza. Home <laughs> Home okay, homemade, yeah. So, you actually lashed on the right thing. The two sentences here about the pizza company, one is, this is the best pizza in town, and this is homemade pasta. Best pizza in town, I don't know. I, did anybody buy that? It was the best pizza in town. Like, what does best mean? Best of what? Is it best of Chandni Chowk? Is it best of Chicago? Is it best of what? But home in everybody gets, they understand it's something that was made at home. It's more specific, it's more related. So the first thing when you're having these conversations, especially the harder ones, be specific. Be, cons be very, very, uh, don't use jargons. Don't, don't assume you know your target audience. Don't talk to them in a language that they probably don't understand. Using words like best, awesome. Well, that's good as an appreciation once in a while, but when you're doing a critique, when you're actually trying to understand a stand, saying awesome doesn't really do anything. Or saying, oh, this is not good enough. Compared to what? What am I solving? So when we started having those conversations, what he realized was he was not giving any <coughs> specific feedback. He would either say it was awesome, or he would either say, go figure it out. So there was no midway, right? And that's what I needed at that point to figure out how to get those answers from being, it's okay, figure it out, to going to awesome. Um, and, and when somebody says, hey, trust me, versus when somebody takes you to that path, path where you actually trust them on their own, I think it's a very different journey. If, if a website says, trust me, I don't think anybody's going to be on that. <laughs> so. Um, the second step when you're having a conversation is be very, very credible, be very, very consistent. If you tell me something one day, if you like a design, and you say, oh, this is awesome, you know, but next day you're like, oh, no, this is not that great anymore, you really don't know what changed in that day, right? What happened? Like, I just showed you the same things. Same applies when you're having conversations. If I don't, if, I, if there's something not credible about me, are not consistent about me, you're not going to trust me. As designers, we're always creating designs that our users can trust, right? And we do that by being consistent in how we're presenting information so that they remember what they saw in the first screen versus the last screen. And that's what would cost the trust. So we should do that when we're talking because consistency creates connections. Remember the human chain manager I talked about? I only worked with her for eight months. But, but the, the consistency and the credibility like, took me so far and I trust that she's still a good mentor of me. I always look up to her for answers because I understand that she's where she's coming from and we've got that equation going. And this is, this is one thing that especially as scene managers uh, or even we as designers tend to kind of, we tend to solve for others, right? If I see this is a problem, you're like, oh, this is a solution, right? That doesn't help me because when I'm going to be in that situation again, I really don't know where to go from there. Right? But once you learn how to go navigate from point A to B, you can do it no matter who is your manager, who are you dealing with, is it PM, is it dev? So as, as people who are navigating other people, give them ways to figure out solutions. Don't give them, like nobody wants to be in sales pressure, being like, oh, do this. Because if you, you want to run away, at least I want to run away when somebody says do this. Because I want to come to, I want to make my own mistakes and come to my own solutions. So as managers, as those conversations, I think this is really good. Uh, the last thing, which is again like a UX mantra, right? Context is the king. If I just come up to you and say, hey, you know what? You really hurt me. What are you going to do about it? You don't even know what you did to hurt me, right? There's this Friends episode that I always think, um, I don't know how many of you watch Friends, but there's a character called Phoebe, and she gets upset with Ross. And she doesn't tell him why. And he spends, the poor guy spends like months trying to figure out why she's upset, and in the end she says, I forgot. I don't remember what I was upset, right? So he couldn't really get to her without understanding what was it that. So when I started these conversations with my manager, and again, as a UX, storytelling is something that comes very innately to us, I started giving him specific instances saying, hey, this meeting happened, and that's what happened, and you know, this is what I felt about it, so what do you think? Maybe he has a justification for what he did, and I can help, and I can be more empathetic towards where he's coming from, or he understands my point of view, and can be more inclusive about it. So we started doing these things once we had this conversation, pretty much every week where I would give him feedback on the way things have happened over the last week, and he would kind of give him me either like why he did what he did, or 
say, okay, I, I get what you're saying and try to fix it. So, so the bottom line of all this is, this is like, if there's one thing I want you to walk away with is, have these conversations. They seem very obvious, they seem something that it's very human, but we forget to have these conversations with the people that really matter. So, you know, next time you are in a sticky spot, try to put yourself in the other person's shoes. Try to understand the problem. Ask for help. That's totally okay. It doesn't make you weak. It just shows actually, if somebody asks me for help, I feel like really good about it and actually feel somebody values what I'm saying. So, I, I, it, like what I said, it puts you in the driver's seat. And be clear about what you're saying. Be very, very specific. Don't use jargon. Don't be wishy-washy about either as a manager about what you feel about your subordinates or somebody who is talking up to your manager and provide context to all this. So why aren't we doing, I mean, it seems so obvious, right, like we should be all doing it, but since even then I hear so many stories where people feel like the manager doesn't get it, the PM doesn't get them, why are we not doing it? Because it takes work. This is something that's never going to be a part of your OKR or your, you know, your weekly quarterly goals or whatever you have. It's something that needs to come from a country. It needs to drill from top bottom, uh, top to bottom, and it's something that people need to start practicing. And it takes effort. It's, it's time consuming. But once you get that going and make it innate to your, um, how you conduct your experiences, it, it gets really easy. Um, and the reason why this is all very critical for us, especially as designers or product owners, is. Because once you become this person who's kind of interacting with everybody and trying to understand their point of view, you become the facilitator, right? You are the one who has everybody's buy-in because they all have like equations. So you become the loop that's connecting everything, which is a product for you. And then you can build better products, you can be more efficient, you can help mitigate any issues that might come up. And this, this really helps in team building and product delivery. So this is like the final thought I want to leave you with. So as UX people, we all say like weird experiences are things that people don't even notice, right? If I actually feel like if I go for a user research and they don't say anything about the design, I feel like it's awesome, right? It worked for what they wanted to do, and that's best. But great teams are something that people won't forget. My first manager, like I said, I only worked with her for eight minutes, but she's somebody that is my benchmark always. And I always strive to either form those kind of bonds with people or either get to that level because I know there's better out there. So if you have a great team, a great work culture, it will go way beyond the product. It will be like a legacy for you. So thank you. Any questions? Yeah. So, so you mentioned about consistency. I'm not, I got the rest of right. the slide, but not sure about So the uh, consistency in how you behave with people, right? So I've seen certain managers who are really nice when you talk to them in person. And I have that experience firsthand actually. So I mean, you're talking very nice when you're talking to them. They wouldn't point out anything, but you go in a team meeting and they're saying something very different, right? So it's the consistency in how you... Well, if I say something here and I say something... And it's also like, if I understand this is how you're going to react to things, I can better prepare myself. I can cater my product to But if I don't understand what you want, it's going to be always like a mystery thing. Sometimes you'll be happy, sometimes you'll be sad, and I wouldn't know why. You can go and search and then see why. If only. <laughs> Anything else? Great. Awesome. I hope you guys practice this and would love to get any feedback on this. This is something I believe as a designer uh, we all should do. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you.